Dear colleagues, welcome to our session. Our focus today is child psychosomatics, and we have tried to assemble the leading speakers in this topic. Uh, we are waiting for your questions, and we will definitely answer them. Mm, attention, we will use the questions button in the top, um, um, top right corner of the screen. Uh, let me suggest the next speaker is Dr. Anna Pagodina, who is a head of laboratory pediatrics and cardiovascular pathology, scientific center for family health and human reproduction problems from Irkutsk. Dear colleagues, I am glad to welcome you. And today we'll talk about one of the important problems of modern world. This is obesity problem. Nowadays, obesity has reached pandemic proportion. In 2016, 50 million girls and 74 million boys worldwide were obese. The COVID-19 pandemic caused great changes in children's and adolescents' life. It's likely that isolation, distance education, drastic reduction of availability of extracurricular activities and therefore reduction of physical activities will correct the values of obesity prevalence all over the world. So far, we only have preliminary data. Results of meta-analysis of 12 studies from eight countries show that the number of both overweight and obese children has increased for the stay-at-home period. This is of great concern due to the impact of obesity on cardiometabolic outcomes. Uh, here you can see uh, the results of four prospective cohort studies that matched body mass index in childhood and then in adulthood. Overweight or obesity in children who later become obese adults uh, has been shown to increase the risk of diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and atherosclerosis. The risk of cardiometabolic outcomes uh, among subjects who were overweight or obese in childhood, but non obese in adults, was similar to the risk among those who had a consistently normal BMI. I think uh, this is uh, good news. So, it's extremely important to focus on the control of cardiometabolic risk factors. The main one is obesity in childhood. As uh, we all know, obesity has a multitude of reasons. But cancer stress may play at least a partial role in its occurrence. According to the comprehensive definition of Baum, stress is a negative emotional experience accompanied by predictable biochemical, physiological, cognitive and behavioral changes uh, that are di directed as a devout altering the stressful event or accompanying to its effects. Indeed, stress and obesity are linked through each of these types of changes. Also, more often towards the goal of accommodation to the effect of stress uh, rather than of altering the actual stressful events. Self-regulation is a key factor which includes voluntary control and impulsivity control. The voluntary control concept includes the ability to control or promote behavior to achieve long-term goals. The impulsivity is mark, um, marked by high sensitivity to gratification and high response um, inhibition deficit. These factors have a direct association with um, dietary restriction, which involves effort to control gratification-based impulses to eat in order to achieve long-term goals in relation to weight. Several studies in children showed that increased impulsivity, reduction of inhibitory control, and high sensitivity to gratification are related with unhealthy food choices and overweight. Uh, the first study used functional MRI to investigate neural activation during a food specific go on goal task in adolescent girls ranging from lean to obese. A result suggests that hyperfunctioning of inhibitory, inhibitory control regions and increased response of food reward regions are linked with high BMI. These results are supported by a prospective longitudinal cohort study. Self-regulatory capacity was meshed in two behavioral protocols, self-controlled procedure at age 3 and the delay of gratification procedure at age 5. 
compared with children who showed um, uh, high self-regulation in both behavioral protocols, children who exhibited a compromised ability to self-regulate had the highest BMI that scores in each point and the most rapid gains in BMI that scores over the nine-year period. So, self-regulation failure in earlier childhood may predispose children to excessive weight gain through early adolescence. Uh, the cognitive processes involved in self-regulatory mechanism are important for behavioral control and eating decision making. However, under stress, these processes such as executive functioning can be disrupted. Uh, this is well illustrated by a study by Evans and colleagues. A nine-year-old child was placed in front of two places of sweets, a large and uh, medium-sized one. The child was taught that the researcher would leave the room and the child could have a large plate of sweets when he returned. But if the child cannot wait and wants candy immediately, then he must give a signal. Uh, then the researcher will come back and give him a medium plate. It turned out that children who experience more cumulative stressors uh, during their lifetime were less able to delay rewards. And these children in turn had a high increase in BMI after four years. Thus, the association between childhood cumulative stress and early adolescence weight gain is mediated by cell regulatory behavior. Stress can contribute to obesity through making unhealthy patterns of eating behavior. Meta analysis of uh, certain studies showed that the stress was found to be positively related to unhealthy eating in children, such as higher levels of stress were um, associated with greater consumption of unhealthy foods. In stress situations, some people use non adaptive coping strategies, such as taking tasty and high energy foods to control negative emotions and stress. Eating behavior aimed, aimed uh, of overcoming emotion is defined as emotional eating. Most often, emotional eating accompanies negative emotions, including children. In a longitudinal study of rural elementary school students, responses to anger and anxiety were shown to be related to emotional eating. This maladaptive coping strategy may underlie the relationship between emotional dysregulation and obesity. Emotional eating is also linked to an unhealthy diet. In a study of dietary correlates of emotional eating in school children, emotional eating was shown to be associated with the increase in the frequency of consumption of sugary high calorie foods such as cakes and ice cream, salty high calorie foods such as chips and uh, sweet soft drinks. Family eating patterns also have a significant impact on the child eating behavior. Parents and family members influence children's eating patterns not only through the availability of certain foods. Children also learn from their parents' behavior, for example, eating to cope with negative emotion. Parental stress can also contribute to the development of obesity in their children. Moreover, this influence can even be, be exerted in utero. Systematic review of 45 studies showed that maternal glucocorticoids may play a key role in this, modifying the intrauterine environment and leading to cardiometabolic disease in these offspring. Maternal stress can be early associated with adverse cardiometabolic outcomes in offspring in the postnatal period, such as obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension. During the postnatal period, the mother's stress can play a role in general health and wellness of her child. Recent meta-analysis showed that children of mothers experiencing high level of psychological stress are exposed to a high risk of obesity. What is the reason for this association? Uh, there appears to be a negative association between maternal stress and children's physical activities. Among the seven cross-sectional studies examining this association, five found it. Another study found that only parents' financial stress was associated with children's low physical activity. Children of parents with high level of stress 
are less likely to comply with physical activity recommendation and uh, participate in active playlists. Parents who experienced high level of stress were also shown to be less likely to set limits on the amount of time their children watch TV. Uh, here you can see the results of an interesting study that examined children's choice of behavior to cope with stress. Children who watch TV more often have been shown to use TV as a way to cope with stress. But children who have a high level of physical activity in everyday life prefer to use physical activity to cope with stress. This is important because some research suggests that uh, physical activity can be buffered from against the harmful effects of stress on body composition, BMI, metabolic syndrome, or even overall health. health. A frequent symptom of chronic stress in children is sleep disorders. On the other hand, sleep duration have an inverse relationship with obesity. Multiple cross-sectional studies in adults and children confirm this relationship. At the same time, prospective studies have shown that short sleep, du uh, short sleep duration predicts weight gain or obese obesity later in life. The study of Saudi Arabian school children confirmed that short sleep duration, less than seven hours in this study, is associated uh, with higher risk of being overweight and obese. Unfortunately, we live in society that stigmatizes people of high body weight. Uh, one common but often overlooked aspect of obesity is how stressful it is to experience such weight stigma. In study of students from 20 schools, 27% of students reported weight-related teasing. Among those seeking treatment for weight loss, the prevalence was even higher. 64% of adolescents uh, enrolled in weight loss camps experienced weight-based victimization. Stigma related with weight was stable. Most participants um, reported weight-based victimization in during for one year, and 36% were teased for five years. A growing body of evidence supports a like between uh, a link between um, weight stigma and detrimental short-term and long-term psychological and emotional consequences affecting both children and their parents. Uh, this includes uh, psychosocial impairments, uh, decreased executive function, deterioration of health-related quality of life, unhealthy weight control behaviors, and uh, impaired weight control. Studies have shown that these negative effects can occur regardless of source of the stigma, which may include family, peers, teachers, the media, and even healthcare, healthcare professionals. Uh, thus, uh, stress and obesity share not only common neurobiological mechanism, but also many common behavior and emotional characteristics. There is no doubt that successful intervention for prevention and managing obesity in children have to be complex and multi-component and combine traditional strategies and behavioral and psychological approaches. A systematic review of behavioral change te techniques are found that only a small number of intervention focused on learning or to manage stress and control emotions. However, in general, these studies were effective, uh, which uh, determines uh, the importance of scientific and practical research in this uh, direction. Now I have finished. Thank you for your attention. Dear colleagues, dear guests, let me introduce the presentation entitled Neuropsychological Aspects of Psychosomatic Pathology in Children and Adolescents. The issue of mental correlates of somatic diseases and their being related to the symptoms of the brain dysfunction is represented by scientific works in many countries. Medical neuropsychology is a line of research in this field. This field of neuropsychology is under rapid development now. The report presents the results of research conducted in the field. They are dedicated to the entries on certain psychosomatic diseases on the change of hemispheric asymmetry occurrence of the emotional and cognitive disorders, 
are potentially caused by rearrangements in the integrative activity of the brain. A total of 517 children and adolescents aged 10 and uh, 18 were examined, including 288 boys and 229 girls whose average age was 15. 217 participants were included in the control group uh, of uh, practically healthy children. In the study group included 300 patients with uh, psychosomatic disease, including uh, 160 patients with hypertension and uh, 111 with obesity and 29 with bronchial edema. The study and control groups were age and gender matched. The hemispheric functional asymmetry, emotional state, and cognitive functions were study. A battery of tests largely included in the Deluria cognitive function study method for the use. Sensory motor asymmetry assessment uh, included self assessment using the N questionnaire, motor and sensory tests, uh, in which uh, the leading hand and the leading eye and the leading ear were determined. The emotional state was determined using techniques adapted for childhood and adolescence. Statistical analysis of the data was conducted using the Statistica 10 software. Consideration of the features of mental development in children and adolescents of different groups will begin with the analysis of formation of hemispheric asymmetry which being the most important mechanism of the brain determines many psychological and physiological processes in humans. The following slides show the data of the state of the functional sensimotor asymmetry in the children and adolescents with the psychosomatic disorders compared with the control group. The slides show that in all samples and patients with psychosomatic disorder, a mixed type of asymmetric review. This phenomenon may reflect a low level of development of interhemispheric asymmetry associated with the, a decrease in the dominance of the left hemisphere. This type of asymmetry persisted throughout the entire period of ontogenetic study. In addition, uh, in children and adolescents with a psychosomatic pathology, increased liability and stability of uh, interhemispheric interactions was noted. Received data indicate the following features of hemispheric asymmetry in psychosomatic disorders. Low sensory motor asymmetry, poor or lack of dynamics of asymmetry in pathogenesis, increased hemisphere interaction liability. The nature of changes in hemispheric interaction and the features of asymmetry formation in ontogenesis indicates a decrease in left hemisphere resources in children and adolescents with psychosomatic disorders. In this case, an increased change in the activity of the right or left hemisphere and unstable hemispheric activity may lead to rearrangements in the integrative activity of the brain. Such arrangements of hemispheric interaction will have a negative impact on the formation of emotional reactions and cognitive functions. Emotional changes in children with psychosomatic disorders begin at an early age. As early as in the preschool age, we see a change in the emotional response in the form of an increase in the level of anxiety in children with obesity. Emotional changes were noted at the older age, accompanying other psychosomatic diseases. Here, increased anxiety was accompanied uh, by aggression and depressive reactions. Children with psychosomatic disorders showed emotional ability and tendency to depressive states. Thus, emotional processes in adolescents with psychosomatic pathology were characterized by increased anxiety in combination with emotional ability and a tendency to depressive and addictive reactions, as well as a decrease in self-esteem. 
the nature of emotional changes was similar in all children and adolescents with hypothermic pathologies and consisted in increased emotional lability. The absence of constant dominance of certain emotional states increased negative emotional reaction with control over emotional states. Now we turn to the analysis of status of function proper. In the study of indicator of voluntary attention, a low level of concentration of attention was noted. In patients with psychosomatic disorders. In the control group of adolescents, a constant improvement in focus on voluntary attention continued during the study monogenesis period. In the study group, attention focus was at lower levels. Improvement actually stopped in the middle and older group of adolescents. The study of speech processes showed a decrease in the number of words actualized in the associative text. A change in speech tone dynamics and critical semantic grouping. This could be due to impaired physiological mechanism of verbal networks or semantic fields, which is associated with the increased the functional capabilities of the front temporal lobes, mainly of the left hemisphere. Of the main indicators characterized of cognitive development of children with the psychosomatic pathology in the early appearance of symptoms of impaired audiovisual memory, increased consolidation of memory traces when transmitting information in the long term memory can be also considered as a key element in verbal memory and psychosomatic diseases. At the same time, the development from visual memory and uh, visual spatial functions did not differ from the control group. Now we turn to the analysis of the state of cognitive functions proper. We revealed features of mental activity in patients with psychosomatic disorders constitute a single clearly defined symptom factor in which one group of mental functions, attention, speech, auditory, or verbal memory is impaired, while the other, visual memory, visual spatial function, develops within normal. This symptom cluster is similar to a single symptom cluster caused by a deep brain structure disorders of various etiology, but has a middle degree of manifestation. Therefore, we can assume that the features of the mental development of children and adolescents with psychosomatic disorders are determined by the functional state and psychological formation that are part of a single morphofunctional block. It forms a single symptom complex that reflects the psychosomatic status of patients. This block includes the thalamus, hypothalamus, coded nucleus, uh, cingulate gear uh, gyrus, and corpus callosum, which form a morphofunctional system. All changes in cognitive activity and emotional sphere in children and adolescents with various psychosomatic disorders are included in single symptom uh, cluster that reflect their psychosomatic status. The symptom cluster is similar to that occurring when deep brain structures are affected. Therefore, it can be assumed that the functional state of the system determines the psychological features of patients with psychosomatic pathology. In conclusion, it can be noted that the question remains open why somatic disorders of various etiologies that affect deep structures, mainly of the left hemisphere, as part of a psychosomatic process and impaired mental processes associated with the frontal temporal lobe. Uh, so much is a very interesting report. Uh, we are waiting for your questions to the special chat. Um, um, we using uh, questions uh, buttons button. Um, at the now we are giving the floor to another leading professors Arhutina Tatiana and uh, uh, Prebojenka Alexandra who is high experience and uh, long practice in this field. Uh, neuropsychological analysis of higher mental functions 
in um, children with congenital heart disease. Please, you have, you, you have the floor. Good day, dear participants of the conference. Our report is devoted to the study of the neuropsychological aspect of higher mental functions in children with congenital heart disease. A literature review uh, showed that many children with CHD have learning difficulties, in particular in reading and mathematics acquisition, building social contacts, the formation of the emotional and motivational personal sphere. Also, the IQ score is in the middle range for most children with CHD. Statistical comparisons between children with CHD and the control group reveal significant differences in overall IQ scores in favor of the control group. Um, when analyzing individual mental functions, difficulties were found in the direction retention switching and attention span, a decrease in the speed of work and fine motor dexterity, problems with oral motor skills and speech articulation, deficits in visual spatial processing and visual memory, and weakness of various components of executive functions. We haven't found studies that would assess the state of the functions of regulating the activation of mental activity in children with CHD. And fatigue slowness. At the same time, our hypothesis was that the work of these functions is disrupted due to the conditions of formation in embryogenesis and the conditions of social environment, which contributes to a general picture of the state of cognitive functions in children with CHD, and may even in part be the cause of a deficit in executive functions. Our study included 67 children uh, with diagnosis of CHD and 159 children without, uh, aged 6 to 11 years. They were divided into four age groups, preschoolers, first, second and third grade. The children performed computerized neuropsychological tests from the battery of computer tests Ahutina 2017 aimed at assessing processing of auditory speech and visual spatial information, programming regulation and control or executive functions, the state of the functions of regulating the activation of mental activity. Six tasks were selected. In the first test, the subject is presented with a set of 10 images of objects whose names are similar in sound. The subject is asked to memorize and reproduce sequence of words. In each subsequent sequence, the number of words increases. In the second test, on the computer screen, nine cubes are presented, which light up in turn. The task of the subject is to remember and then sequence. Each next sequence has one element more than the previous one. The third test, dots, consists of the three series, each including 20 presentations of stimuli, in response to which the subject must respond by pressing key, keys according to the instructed. From the side of the stimulus, hard congruent series. On the opposite side, of the stimulus, flower, incongruent series, and to randomly appearing stimuli according to two previously learned instructions, hearts and flowers, conflict series. In the fourth test, it's necessary for the subject to listen to the named parts of the body and each time press instead of the current one on the previous one. In the fifth 
uh, the different kinds of grammatical constructions are given by ear and on the screen the subject has to choose one of the two pictures corresponding to it and in the last there are five shortest tables where the subject needs to search for and indicate numbers in a different order of more than 80 indicators measured in each sample 47 were selected to assess the cognitive functions mentioned above. The factor of age-related changes in cognitive functions was taken into account by standardizing row scores. In order for the study to reflect precisely the impact of heart disease on the state of mental functions, we also excluded from the sample children with combined neurological and genetic disease. Right-hand children predominate in both samples. We also used the medical division of children with CHD into two subgroups in accordance with the severity of the disease uh, and the negative impact on the body. Children with acyanotic pale and cyanotic blue defects with an increase in the negative impact respectively. Uh, data processing was performed in Chamovi in accordance with the hypothesis but forward two processing procedures were made. First, analysis of variance one way ANOVA for three groups conditional normal and two subgroups of defects, blue and pale. Then students t-test for two groups, conditional norm and the general group of children with CHD. For non-normally distributed data, the non-parametric method, kraskal wallace test, man witnit u-test and uh, the Welsh t-test were used. No significant were found between the groups of cyanotic and pale heart defects, presumably due to the size of the samples. Between the group of children with CHD as a whole and the control group, significant or close to the significance level differences were found. This concerns such parameters as the increased response time to stimuli in the last Schulter's tables, the positive difference between the average response time in the fifth and three thirds tests of the Schulter's tables, the increased average reaction time in response to the clone test. These three indicators can be attributed to the symptoms of increased fatigue. Other indicators such as a decrease in the speed of the first answer in Corsi cubes and more errors in the first shooters table are characteristic of entering the task difficulty. Both types of the difficulties are manifested with a deficiency in the functions of regulation of mental activity. Um, the next group of indicators is extensive. There are several parameters in dots, a decrease in the average reaction time in all three series, a decrease in the accuracy of the second incongruent series and the first congruent, more errors in the entire task, a greater spread in the response time to the stimulus in the third series, conflict. This is also a decrease in average reaction time in the test for understanding prepositional constructions with a decrease in actual understanding. All of the above can be interpreted as symptoms of impulsivity. We are talking about combined difficulties here, since it is necessary to add the difficulties of executive functions to the weakness of functions of activation in order to explain the phenomenon.
the last group consisted of a decrease in the number of correct answers in the last four in the test for understanding similar sounding words, an increased number of substitution, omission, and answer out of orders, and increased mean reaction time in clone. These parameters may indicate the difficulties of receiving, processing, and storing auditory speech information, which correlates with the difficulties described in the literature. It should be noted that a large number of indicators also related to functions that are supposed to suffer didn't reveal significant differences. Also, the difference between the average values of those indicators that found significant difference is small. This, on the one hand, indicates a less critical state of the mental functions of children that one might expect and a large correctional potential. And on the other hand, it shows the need to increase sample size. Uh, however, we also can't ignore the fact that there are differences between groups of children with and without CHD. And in the future, it's necessary to search for more specific symptom complexes. Children with this diagnosis need effective corrective intervention and based on the policy of rehabilitation cardiological centers in recent years, they can receive such intervention. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you for you. This is a very interesting report. Uh, if you have any questions, send them to the chat. Uh, this report reflects uh, best experience in neuropsychological analysis in childhood. Um, we, as we, we uh, move on, let me introduce, introduce uh, the following speakers. Svetlana Rachenka, Dayar, France, Diana Bikoyo, Russia, origins of interpersonal conflicts and uh, their manifestations in depression and uh, psychosomatic disease. This is a joint report. Uh, please have uh, the flow. Uh, I uh, said that uh, our um, main aim of our report is to show to the intercultural and theoretic aspects of causes of the transpersonal uh, intrapersonal conflict in the um, etymology with other uh, conflict. Uh, the subject of our research uh, uh, are based on including identifying the origins of uh, intrapersonal conflict and depression with uh, the connection uh, of other, uh, other conflicts of human activity. Uh, and another uh, object uh, you see is adapting empirical psychotherapeutic method in our clinical practice as a psychologist and using uh, our findings in university teaching. Mm, uh, uh, The uh, uh, interpersonal conflict is, speci is a specific conflict um, in uh, human activity. It is necessary to distinguish, uh, distinguish uh, conflicts of uh, different level. Interpersonal conflict is defined as a state of an organist subject uh, to uh, contradictory forces emanating from a situation of or from the organism itself. Uh, this conflict can be explicit or latent and uh, contribute to the formation of uh, symptoms, uh, behavior disorders, personality disorders, and um, denial of reality. So, uh, they can be the cause of uh, neurosis and psychosis. Uh, 
the main uh, the, our material and hypothesis uh, was um, uh, main hypothesis was structure uh, um, uh, variation uh, in personality uh, change um, uh, is specific uh, in specific psychological factors uh, in its main disorganization and depression for people with intrapersonal conflict. Uh, this conflict appears uh, as sentimental, family, friendship, social, uh, professional, international, and aggravated by uh, disorganization or interpersonal uh, reorganization. The main causes of uh, uh, con conflict uh, we see, the, according to our um, empirical research, uh, we made uh, uh, established that the, the usual typical and banal causes of inter. Um, psychic uh, conflict um, offer cause uh, divergent symptoms of depression in an individual and subsequently causes a very device um, and uh, often distorted of his personality structure. Uh, main uh, type or uh, of uh, um, intrapersonal conflict uh, uh, is um, uh, we we see we see that uh, and our research shows uh, uh, that uh, conflict intrapersonal is associated with psychological factors seems all really are feeling value motives needs and so on. Uh, uh, and uh, somatic uh, and mental problems that uh, re, um, uh, reduce the, uh, reduce the possibility of self-realization and the um, quality of human life. Uh, based uh, on the analysis, we. Um, uh, um, we can say that uh, interpersonal conflict is um, another variety of tips, uh, frustration, anxiety, motivational uh, conflict, uh, and uh, so on. And each of uh, which uh, requires re special methods of psychotherapeutic and psychological systems. Uh, we um, uh, uh, can say that uh, in our studies uh, we found that uh, uh, the dynamical process of psychoanalytic uh, cure that we examine depend on um, some conditions. For example, what Rachenko's study shows the dynamic process of psychoanalytic uh, cure that we examine depend um, uh, variable relate to the dynamic process and play of impulses in the dynamic of interaction between patient and analyst. Rachenko uh, makes the conclusion that they can be able in three main areas in the initial training of psychoanalyst, in the um, uh, establishment of therapeutic alliance analyst patient, and uh, that in the case of um, reduction of transfer uh, counter transfer effect by the method of self uh, psychotherapy of analyst uh, or with uh, his colleague analyst. And we um, uh, can um, uh, conclusion 
that uh, manifestation of conflict uh, interpersonal conflict is due to the neurological and psychological problem which are factors of change in the structure of the personality ranging from life form to personality depersonalization to depression neurosis and psychosis or a borderline we assume the psychosomatic research is aimed at revealing uh, the relationship between psychological ind indicators of experience, personality behavior, and somatic processes, and important um, analyze the relationship uh, of the patient with other people, uh, with relates, uh, um, with uh, uh, attending um, uh, physicians. Uh, and uh, we may um, uh, made uh, some recommendation um, uh, of our uh, experience. Um, uh, first recommendation is the mission of psychologist is the uh, accompaniment of students in their university career which are also based on the psychological tool and method adapted to student uh, being in uh, uh, um, quantity and um, another recommendation is uh, student at uh, student of uh, 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 risk uh, of uh, uh, development of depression, uh, other ps ps psychosomatic um, uh, psychosomatic disorder, uh, uh, psychosomatic disorder. And uh, uh, we made uh, some conclusion uh, uh, one of is that uh, resolution of interpersonal conflict is a relation to conflict uh, described uh, uh, and uh, treatment uh, and can be diffused uh, uh, under three conditions individual, patient, analyst, psychologist, uh, or, or um, uh, mini group. Uh, with small groups and large group and uh, we um, can say that one of the effects uh, effective method of overcoming interpersonal conflict is uh, um, out to get generous training and uh, psychological counseling uh, it's all uh, uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. If you have a, a question, uh, write me. <laughs> thank you uh, for much. Thank you so much. Uh, you have presented very interesting data. We would like to work more closely in this field uh, with you. Your questions, please. Uh, thank you, too. Uh, we are more moving, and uh, I want to give the floor to Lydia Evert, um, our dear colleague, a professor from Krasnoyarsk, Russia, who has been working on the issue of psychosomatics of childhood uh, with uh, his team for many years. Uh, Comabert Association of um, Smartphone Addiction in Adolescents and Students in Different Regions of Siberia. You are welcome, dear Lydia Evert.
Dear colleagues, uh, let me introduce uh, my report of the topic. Uh, this slide shows the team members that participated in this study. Information technology has become an integral part of our lives and Canada continues to expand its presence in all areas of activity. This is due to the improvement of the quality characteristic of electronic devices as well as the emergence of new forms of interaction with their users. The mobile phone has become an integral attribute of modern human life. Its role can hardly be exaggerated. When reasonable use, it is a wonderful assistant. You can always contact relatives and friends, find the necessary information at any time, it is used as a camera, notebook, storage of the necessary files, and as an electronic wallet. But at some point, the phone begins to subdue us, and we become dependent on it to varying degrees. In the modern world, the number of users of these devices are growing from year to year, and it is increasingly difficult to develop the habit of conscious and moderate use of smartphones and multi and young people. Smartphone addiction is a new phenomenon of one of the most common non medical addictions, which, by its mass nature, has already left behind internet addiction and gambling addiction. Women are dangerous to cooperate with them. The negative consequences of smartphone addiction can include psychological and behavioral problems, as well as problems with the somatic health of users including the development of functional somatic disorders in them. Smartphone users can use smartphones for many hours a day, on the road, on vacation, while studying or at work, which puts a strain of the eye, neck, and back, brain, other organs and systems. Along with the development of mental uh, dependence on the mobile phone, users have increased risk of headaches, diseases, pain in muscles and different parts of the body, noise and pain in the ear, sleep disorders, palpitation, fatigue, irritability, irritability difficult concentrating, auditory hallucinations. As people become more and more dependent on these devices, research is needed to solve an urgent problem. Whether frequent uncontrolled use of smartphones can lead to health problems, which disorders and uh, pathological conditions are most often associated with smartphone addiction. We conducted a large-scale screening examination of adolescents and students aged uh, from 15 to 18 and from 19 to 25 years, boys and girls, living in large cities of five regions of Siberia, Krasnoyarsk, Krasnoyarsk territory, Irkutsk, Irkutsk region, Yakutsk, Republic of Yakutia, Abakan, Republic of Kakassia, and Kizil, Republic of Tiva. A total of 2,080 people were examined, of which 1,030 people were examined with a computer assisted web interview with Google Forms, and 1,050 who survived using similar questionnaires, included the Google Forms. The presence of smartphone addiction was assessed according to the questionnaire that smartphone addiction scale development of a short version for adolescents. The type of headaches were verified taking into account the criteria for the frequency of several year episodes set out in international today classification. The presence of recurrent abdominal pain, back pain, and athletic syndrome was verified by a screen questionnaire developed by Professor Tereschenko using the criteria proposed by author. 
The type of online behavior was assessed on the chain scale. The total CAI score of 27.2 points per regarded as adaptive internet use, 43 to 64 points as non-adaptive internet use, and 65 points and higher at pathological internet use or internet addiction. The results of our study showed that the prevalence of smartphone addiction in overall online survival population was 19.7%. Addiction was more Often registered among students, 22.3% versus 70.1% among adolescents. In the overall population of the examined subjects, sex difference of the analyzed indicator were not revealed. In the adolescents group with the prevalence of smartphone addiction was higher among girls than boys, 80.6% and 15% respectively. And the contrary, in the group of the students, it was higher among boys, 27.8% versus 21.0%. We have established a statistically significant association of smartphone addiction with maladaptive and pathological online behavior, and also in general with maladaptive online behavior of the surveyed adolescents and students of the general sample. Analysis of the content consumed by smartphone users show that smartphone dependent individuals are statistically significantly more likely to stay in social networks. Uh, there were no significant differences in the compared group in such component of the consumed content in, as listening to music, reading, use, using email. Dear colleagues, let me introduce the report of the topic Hyperactive Children, Causes and Ways to Overcome Hyperactivity. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder is a condition in which the function of central nervous system is impaired, resulting in disorders of psycho-emotional development.
ADHD is fair concurrent physiological disorder occurring in 8, 11 of all school children in boys and condition of three times more common than in girls. The syndrome persistent in into adulthood in 60% of cases. According to some authors, from 2 to 28% of the entire child population, with as many as 40% of children with borderline disorder. Five symptoms of ADHD are sufficient to confirm the diagnostic in patients over age 17. According to ISCD-10, a diagnosis of ADHD requires confirmation of at least six manifestations of inattention, at least three of hyperactivity, and at least one of impulsivity. Causes of ADHD. The first one is genetic. The polygenic concept of ADHD and inheritance has been proven. Uh, this has been confirmed using the twin methods, family analysis, and the foster child methods, which showed an inheritance of ADHD in the limit of. 78%. The association of a dopaminergenic, serotoninergenic, glutamatergenic genes, metabolic pathways, membrane proteins, mutations in uh, all the suppressor genes and cytokine genes associated with ADHD was revealed. Significant comorbidity of ADHD with other mental disorders was determined. The role of CNS mutation uh, in the development of ADHD has been revealed. Many genes with a minor effect have been identified that contribute to the development of ADHD in the CNV effects. It is suggested that transposon dysregulation is important in the tuning of gene regulatory networks and epigenetic control of neurons and contributes the ADHD, which may be a general principle that united with neurogenous pathways pathology. Prenatal and parental pathological factors form the basis of early organic CNAS damage. Toxicosis and eclampsia age of the mother over 30 years carried pregnancy, prolonged labor, prematurity, morphofunctional maturity, and ethnic hypoxic and hepatopathy diseases of the child in the first year of life. The next one is the social factor. Social status of the family, existence of the criminal environment, severe disagreements between parents, uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, alcoholism, and abnormal sexual behavior in the mother, violations of family parenting styles, informatization of learning and education increases the load and the mental functions of the child, increasing the number of hyperactive children.
Currently, that we variants of the courses of ADHD dependent on clinical manifestation. Uh, the combined form combining attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, ADHD with predominant attention deficit disorder, ADHD with predominance, predominance of hyperactivity and impulsivity. Various scales and questionnaires have been compiled based on the criteria for diagnosing ADHD. On a short scale is usually used to assess a child's behavior at school and at home and it is applied in the wide age range from 3 to 70 years old. The questionnaire was adapted and tested in 1992 at the station of Moscow Medical Academy uh, and is uh, currently used in Russian school. The Vanderbilt questionnaire can also be used including the teacher version and parent version. Its particularity consists in the presence of additional questioning assessing the anxious, depressive symptomatology and social adaptation. Uh, the Pumach method of an assessment scale of the hyperactivity by interviewing parents and teachers, as well as observation of the daily routine character and behavior of children has proved to be well proven in school conditions. Standard psychological examination of children with ADHD, ADHD is conducted using the Wexler technique for assessment of general levels of intellectual development of child, the Loria 19 uh, neuropsychological technique, examination of the attention sphere using the of read, reading test, uh, the group test, uh, the coding subtest from the Wexler method. The main manifestations of ADHD to which it is necessary to pay attention is inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsiveness. Treatment of ADHD should be complex, include both medication therapy and psychological correction. Ideally, the child should be observed by a doctor and a psychologist, as well as feel the support of parent and their belief in a positive or common treatment. This support reinforces for the skill the child develops during treatment. Recent studies have shown the promise of using biofeedback as a method of neurobiocontrol of ADHD. The nurses consist in registration and demonstration of EHG parameters to the patients in the monitoring game plan. 
The main task is to teach self-regulation of these parameters. Modification of the bioelectrical activity of the brain is focused on the mechanism of neuroplasticity and brainstem connection with subcortical information and prefrontal complex. It has been established that the effectiveness of neurobiological control techniques for it is comparable to the effectiveness of uh, psychostimulants. It is recommended to prescribe medication when cognitive impairment and behavioral problems in a child with ADHD are not amenable uh, to psychological and pedagogical correction alone. The drugs of choice abroad with psychostimulants is a uh, methylphenidate and amphetamine. Uh, they have a pathogenetic effect increasing the concentration of endogenous neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. Clinical effects during treatment is noted at 70 80 of children and poor memorization of behavior, improving academic attention and memory. The most common adverse effects is sleep disturbance, decreased appetite, headache, and non abdominal pain, irritability, ticks, transition weight loss, tachycardia, increased. New effective drug used in the treatment of ADHD is automoxicetin hydrochloride, which does not belong to the group of CNS stimulants. Its main mechanism of action. In our country, they mainly uh, use correctional pedagogical techniques, biofeedback technologies, physical therapy, and massage. Observance of the daily routine, proper nutrition, work with psychologists gives good uh, thought not constant results. Despite the fact that ADHD has been sufficiently studied, the problem of studying of the pathogenesis and treatment of ADHD remains topical. Thank you for your attention. An excellent report. Uh, dear colleagues, please send your questions um, to the chat. Uh, now let's give the floor to Jan, a uh, psychologist, a promising researcher at, uh, at our center. Aryuna Kosovceva, um, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has made an adjustment to our lives practical work and scientific research. Uh, so now we will hear a report on the following topic. Um, cognitive, um, cognitive and emotional impairment in pregnant women with COVID-19. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm presenting to your attention a report Cognitive and Emotional Impairment in Pregnant Women with COVID-19. Uh, in this report, I would like to discuss three main aspects related to COVID-19. The first is uh, what cognitive and other uh, psychological and psychiatric disorders are most common in COVID-19. Uh, the second is what areas of the brain are damaged by COVID-19 and what does the sense of smell have to do with it. And the third uh, possible ways of further correction from the point of view of clinical psychologist and of course share on results regarding cognitive and emotional and olfactory disorders in pregnant women with COVID-19. Indeed, a lot of attention and scientific interest concentrate around the COVID-19. This pyramid reflects the relevance of this problem. So over a period of about two years, uh, more than 5 million articles have been published using keyword COVID-19. 
uh, more than 1 million articles on the topic COVID-19 and depression, and about 700,000 publications on the topic COVID and, and anxiety, more than uh, 800,000 articles on the topic COVID-19 and cognitive functions. And please pay attention um, uh, to the floor number five, which shows that more than uh, uh, 18,000 publications have been dedicated to the COVID-19 and olfactory dysfunction in two years. At the same time, less than uh, 50 publications are dedicated to olfactory disorders and cognitive emotional disorders in COVID-19. And <clears throat> the question, what does the sense of smell have to, to, uh, have to do with it? probably is not doubt because smell dysfunction has long been an important marker of COVID-19 and often the first symptom of COVID-19. In addition, often smell dysfunction is one uh, is uh, the only one symptom of COVID and is not accompanied by rhinorrhea, which indicates neurological causes of smell dis disorders, but not conductive ones. Moreover, by uh, now there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of evidence and rational for the neurotoxicity of COVID-19, including brain imaging using MRI and PET. SARS-CoV-2 virus penetrates through, uh, through the olfactory cleft along the olfactory tract uh, via ACE2 receptors reaching the olfactory bulb and further to the structures of the olfactory brain and neighboring regions. All this causes a wide uh, range of clinical manifestations of COVID-19, including a variety of cognitive and emotional uh, impairments. In this slide, you can see three main pathways of uh, neuroinflammation and neuroinvasion of the coronavirus. The first way is the penetration of the uh, virus into the brain through the olfactory epithelium of the nose along the olfactory tract. The mechanisms of uh, virus uh, transmission through the olfactory nerve and its subsequent spread to the CNS are not well, uh, well understood. So the olfactory receptor neurons may be damaged according uh, to another. Uh, the virus can diffuse through channels uh, formed by olfactory cells. Subsequent spread of the virus through the CNAs may, may uh, occur through uh, transsynaptic transport and microdiffusion. Uh, the second way is the penetration of the virus into the brain stem along the uh, vagus nerve from the gastrointestinal tract and lungs. And the third cause of neurotoxicity is the systematic inflammation. Brain visualization allows to see different brain changes in COVID-19. There are uh, different both in nature, for example, micro and macro bleeding and edema, and in uh, tissue type, for example, parenchymal, cortical, subcortical, and white matter. Degree of variability may be explained by uh, the synergetic effect of medical and neurological comorbidities and the intensive treatment of these patients. There is sufficient amount of data about changes in glucose metabolism in the studied areas. The main targets uh, of coronavirus infection, which are visualized by MRI and PET, are uh, structures of the olfactory system, uh, in particular the olfactory bulb, amygdala, and orbital uh, frontal cortex. Uh, cortical regions, in particular the uh, anterior frontal cortex, cingulate, gyrus, insula, temporal cortex. And the third are subcortical regions, including the brain stem and other regions of the first functional block of the brain. At the same uh, time, it's very important that visualized changes in the brain were found not only in patients with moderate and severe COVID, but also in patients with mild COVID up to six months after, this, after the diseases, disease, as well as in patients with only anosmia as the one symptom of COVID. 
Localization of the uh, narrow invasion and brain damage visualized by MRI cause specificity of cognitive and emotional dysfunction, respectively. The most common cognitive dysfunction are impairment of regulatory functions, lack of decision-making processes, attention deficit, decreased short and long-term memory, decreased semantic fluency, violation of visual and spectral functions, and feeling of disorientation. Emotional disorders include depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Among the olfactory disorders in COVID-19, the most common are hyposmia and anosmia and parasmia and phantasmia. In this study, we investigated a pregnant woman with COVID-19, and there are a lot of contradictions regarding the impact of COVID-19 on pregnancy, Though, so there are two main points of view. On the one hand, pregnant women that are prone to several complications due to low immune reactivity and the complex physiological change during pregnancy. And the second point of view postulates the modulate effect of pregnancy on the immune system, which curb the positive um, possibility of developing a cytokine storm and the milder COVID-19 in pregnant women. In this report, we present the results of a survey of 198 um, pregnant women. Uh, 40 with COVID-19, uh, 97 pregnant women who have never had COVID, 30, 32 pregnant women who had COVID during pregnancy but not now, and 20, uh, 19 pregnant women who had COVID before pregnancy. We measured cognitive function using the MOCA test. It's a high value. Uh, 10 minute run and the most common used test for assessing cognitive function in COVID-19. We also uh, used uh, shelter, uh, shelter uh, um, tables. There are five tables with randomly placed numbers that serve to di diagnose the neurodynamic tone of the nervous system and attention. Statistical analysis show, show that a pregnant woman uh, with COVID-19 have lower scores, of, scores on the attention scale of the MOCA test uh, compared with uh, healthy pregnant women who have never had COVID-19 and they are also characterized by greater exhaustion of attention and a decrease in attention concentration according to shelter tables. In this data, sh uh, all this data shows the degrees of the first energy blocks of the brain and basal, basal structures of the brain, which is located in the basal regions, including the steam. It's responsible for the regulation of uh, tone of nervous system and uh, regulation of breathing, cardiovascular activity, sleep, emotional stability, memory and attention. We assess the emotional state using state trait anxiety inventory and Beck's depression scale, consisting of cognitive and somatic subscales. High level of state anxiety was shown in pregnant women with COVID-19 uh, compared to pregnant women who have never had COVID-19 and those who were sick during pregnancy but not now. The depression scale showed no statistically significant differences. Olfactory functions were assessed using the Connecticut Hemisensory Clinical Research Center olfactory test, which includes olfactory threshold evaluation and odor identification assessment. As can be seen in the slide, moderate server hyposmia and anosmia in pregnant women with COVID-19 is almost three times higher than in women who have never had COVID-19. Uh, 62 and 22 percent respectively. Considering the pathophysiology of COVID-19 and uh, the pathways of SARS-CoV-2 neuroinvasion through the olfactory tract, there is an uh, obvious relationship between olfactory disorders and cognitive and emotional functions. 
So uh, correlation uh, analysis in this group of pregnant women with COVID-19 showed that the lower the olfactory threshold and the better the smell perception, the higher the total results of the MOC test indicators of attention and visual spatial functions. The better the patient different differentiates the smell, the higher the indicators of attention, workability, and long-term memory. In general, lower indicators of the efficiency of smell are associated with low speech fluency of patients, which is due to the prefrontal and temporal calvin of the brain. The relationship of smell with emotional disorders was not identified. Thus, we can conclude that cognitive and olfactory impairments in pregnant women with COVID-19 can be caused by toxic damage of the brainstem and limbic reticular complex and possibly can be damaged by the prefrontal regions. And what's, uh, what is important to understand, not only for scientists, but also practice, uh, practicing clinical psychology, psychotherapists and neurologists, Despite the natural recovery of the central nervous system, olfactory and cognitive function and emotional state after COVID, a large number of patients remain with the unpleasant consequences of this disease and often don't notice this problem apparently adapting to this condition. However, even asymptomatic or mild COVID-19 patients have visualized brain changes in critical regions responsible for tone and wakefulness, cognitive functions such as memory, attention, regulatory function, decision-making, speech and emotional state. Therefore, a comprehensive support such as neuropsychological correction of the first and th third uh, functional uh, blocks of the brain and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy gives hope for a better prognosis for the quality of life of these patients. Uh, I wish you health and mental well-being. Thank you for your attention. Let me suggest the next speaker, Ms. Alexandra Sambialova, General Research Assistant of the Laboratory of Personnel at Medicine, uh, Scientific Center for Family Health and Human Reproduction Problems from Irkutsk. Uh, please, Alexandra Sambialova. Hello, dear colleagues and colleagues. I'm a junior researcher at the Laboratory of Personal Medicine, Alexandra Yurina Sambialova. My co-speakers and I thank you for this opportunity to participate in the conference. We present to your attention a pilot study on the topic comparative evolution of adherence to intratraviral therapy in children with perinatal HIV infection. The uh, relevance of the topic is determined by the high prevalence of HIV infection in the world, both among uh, adults and children. According to UNAIDS, estimates in 2020, more than uh, 37 million people are living with HIV worldwide, or with about 1.7 million children under 15 years of age. According to official statistics, more than a million people with HIV infection live in Russia. The Irkutsk region is uh, one of the regions with a high prevalence of HIV infection, including among children and adolescents. There are uh, 676 children and adolescents registered at the Regional Center for Combating HIV AIDS. According to international and Russian clinical guidelines, HIV infection therapy is carried out using a combined uh, schema. It consists of at least three antiretroviral drugs. As a result of ART, the duration and quality of life of patients with HIV infection has increased. The main principles of antiretroviral therapy are voluntariness, uh, cons <clears throat> concision decision to start treatment and its implementation, timeless, starting ART as early as possible, recommended start ART for children with confirmed HIV 
uh, infection regardless of age, uh, clinical manifestation, NCD, four counts. Conti continuity, long-term adherence to an ART regimen and uh, adherence. Low adherence is one of the reasons for the decrease in the effectiveness of treatment. Today, a number of apparatus and techniques have been developed to assess adherence. But so far, this is no gold standard for determining patient adherence to therapy. And one of the most commonly used methods for assessing adherence is a patient questionnaire. The Murisky Green Test is recognized as the most famous, simple and concise. The Murisky Green Test adherence score is a very simple questionnaire and consists of uh, eight questions. The child for their parents and guardians answer the yes-no questions. However, this test is a subjective and according to the editors themselves. The sensitivity of the test is uh, 37%. As a result, the purpose of the study was to conduct a comparative assessment of adherence to antiretroviral therapy in children with perinatal hip infection. Tasks. Assess as adherence of children with perinatal HIV uh, HIV infection using the Morisky Green scale. Assess the concentration of drugs in blood plasma by mass spectrometry. Compare the result of Morisky Green testing, viral load assessment, and measurement of concentration of antiretroviral drugs. This study included. 38 children and adolescent age uh, 7 to 70 years. The average age was 12.4 uh, who are under dispensary observation at the IOC AIDS with a diagnosis of perinatal HIV infection. Inclusion criteria age uh, 70 to 70 years old, established diagnosis perinatal HIV infection, duration of current ART regimen for at least six months, availability of informed voluntary cons consent of parents or legal representatives for teenager under 50 years old and a teenager other 50 years old to participate uh, in a scientific study. Clinical and anamnestic com comparative assessment of clinical status with an analysis of the history of antiretroviral therapy. Questioning of children and legal representatives, Moreski Green, ART adherence, uh, quantification scale, Labor laboratory, determination of viral load by PCR, drug monitoring of antiretroviral drugs, lopinavir, ritanavir, zidovudine, lamivudine, abicavir by mass spectrometry, and statistical analysis. Uh, two or three of the children lived in the family and the girls and uh, equal number of children lived in the city and the village. Of the 38 children, 11 had detectable viral load. Always for children had more than uh, 100 copies milliliter. All patients are shut out individually. Most children and adolescents received regimens based on lopinavir, etanavir, Lamivudin, Zidovudin, Abekavir. Based on the result of the survey, the following data were obtained at a high level of adherence of parents or guardians to ART of their children than the children themselves. We have not found significant differences in the level of viral load in children with varying degrees of adherence. 
both according to the results of a survey of, for, of children and parents or guardians. Next, we determined the concentration of, main, of the main ARVs in children with different level of ad adherence based on the results of the survey. No statistically significant differences were found. Both according to the result of the survey of children and the parents or guardians. In this way, in children with different level of adherence according to the results of, of the Mareski green test, the level of viral load does not differ. In children with different levels of adherence according to the results of the Mareski green test, the concentration of ARVP does not differ. To improve the effectiveness of ART, a comparative approach is needed to assess adherence in children living with HIV infection. We thank you for your attention. Let me suggest the next speaker of our PhD, Olga Bertina, who is learning researcher of the Laboratory of Somnology and Neurophysiology a uh, scientific center for family health and human reproduction problems from Irkutsk. Please, Olga Bertina. Oh, dear colleagues, dear guests, let me introduce my presentation entitled Abstracted Sleep Apnea and Psychosomatic Disorders in Pediatrics. This is our research team. For the beginning, let's talk about what obstructive sleep apnea is and what is this danger to somatic and mental health. Obstructive sleep apnea is one of the most common and serious sleep-related vision disorders. It's a chronic condition characterized by a repetitive collapse uh, in the upper, upper way airway during sleep, leading to oxygen saturation, sympathetic activation, and recurrent arousals. Sleep apnea may affect both men and women, but men much more often. This sleep disorder uh, prevalence in children is 2 to 4 percent, in adolescents at least 2 percent. Hypersomnia and systematic hypertension and insulin resistant obesity, hyperlipidemia and atherosclerosis are consequence of sleep apnea. There are many associations with sleep apnea and neurocognitive dysfunction, psychiatric and psychosomatic disorders. It's now that anxiety disorders and the so-called functional somatic uh, syndromes presented on this slide can accompany sleep apnea. It has been found that children at, uh, with sleep apnea have other uh, neuropsychological uh, no specific symptoms than adults. There are cognitive uh, impairments, academic learning difficulties, behavioral problems, and attention uh, deficit uh, hyperactivity disorders. As already noted, sleep apnea has been associated with psychiatric pathology, which may affect patient's life quality. Uh, it uh, isn't, uh, it is now that number of factors may really play a role in association uh, in metabolic and uh, sleep also. Uh, eventually, as all of uh, these changes affect hemostasis, the individual respond with uh, further uh, biological dysregulation with a probable, uh, as a result, a metabolic syndrome, severe central neurosyn dysregulation, and severe sleep apnea. Se uh, several studies have found this association between sleep apnea, cognitive imp impairments, and depression. It has been found that sleep apnea occurs more frequently in patients with depressive uh, disorders. The study also showed that attention, working memory, episodic memory, and executive functions are decreased in sleep apnea. In impact of sleep apnea of neuro neurocognitive impairments, uh, how can uh, sleep apnea affect uh, neurocognitive function? Hypoxia and sleep fragmentation in sleep apnea uh, can uh, cause hormonal imbalance and neuroinflammation, leading to endothelial dysfunction. What alone with excessive detail sleepness leads to reduced level of concentration and uh, alertness and overall cognitive difficulties. Uh, <clears throat> 
has been found that 2.5 to 12.5% sleep uh, apnea patients have mild cognitive dysfunction and 5 to 15% had moderate to severe one. As mentioned earlier, in children sleep, uh, with sleep apnea is association with cognitive and behavioral deficiencies. It's also known that sleep apnea is associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Some studies have shown that both hypoxia and sleep fragmentation trigger a cascade of physiological reaction that might lead to increasing of plasma ID associated in markets. It has been found that uh, children with sleep apnea have significantly higher levels of circulating beta amyloid 42 than normal children. And obese children with sleep apnea, this indicated was even higher. However, the serum concentration in children with standalone obesity did not show a significant increase. Obesity as psychosomatic disorders. Uh, it should be noted that, like sleep apnea, a serious problem of modern healthcare and society as a rule in the, uh, is the obesity epidemic. Uh, among both uh, adults and children and adolescents. Obesity causes uh, significant damage to a person's life and also affect his mental state and well-being. So obesity uh, is a potent somatic sequel of psychoneurological disorders. In addition, uh, obesity is often comorbid with impairment, impairment uh, cognitive functions uh, such as memory, attention, and thinking. Comorbid uh, psychiatric and somatic uh, conditions significantly increase obesity, burden leading to uh, higher rates of de uh, detrimental outcomes of health and socioeconomic status in adulthood. It's well documented that visceral obesity is closely associated with sleep apnea. Uh, sleep apnea has many uh, uh, obesity promoting effects as well as obesity may contribute to sleep apnea. The comorbidity of sleep apnea and obesity in children and adolescents is also a serious problem of money, modern pediatrics. It was found that the prevalence of sleep apnea in pediatric patients with obesity is 10 or more times higher than in non obese peers. The strongest predictor of adverse uh, behavioral and cognitive outcomes in obese uh, children is a combination of two uh, or more sleep diagnoses. In our research center, uh, the research was conducted to study sleep problems in adolescents with obesity as a model of psychosomatic disorder. Uh, at first, we have studied the prevalence of sleep disorder in obese adult adolescents. It was found that 61.9% of obese respondents had sleep problems. At this, uh, sometimes 63.7% uh, of obese boys and 27% of obese girls have sleep disorders. 44.8% uh, 44, 44. of uh, boys and 20% of girls complained of snoring and stop of breathing during sleep. Next, they can be uh, conducted as a nocturnal polysomnographic study of adolescents with uh, obesity. It has been shown that with a combination of obesity and sleep apnea in adolescents, more significant change in sleep structure are noted than in the uh, absence of sleep apnea, such as increase of, in superficial sleep duration, a decrease in slow wave, wave sleep and REM sleep, in combination with significant saturation after uh, apnea episodes. Given the close uh, relationship between sleep apnea and cognitive impairments, uh, we also conducted a study of cognitive function in the study group adolescents. It has been shown that uh, patients with obesity and sleep apnea demonstrated a significant decrease in cognitive uh, function, which can be considered as a result of change the integrative activity of somnogenic brain structure under the influence of hypoxia. Cognitive deficit which, which uh, occurs during incomplete brain maturation in the absence of sleep treatment, no treatment can progress and cause cognitive dysfun dysfunction in adults. Finally, we have uh, assessed uh, plasma beta amyloid 
uh, levels in adolescence depending on the presence of absence uh, of obesity and uh, sleep apnea. It was found that a patient with obesity and sleep apnea had significantly higher plasma load levels than adolescents with standalone obesity, as well as patients without obesity, regardless of the presence of absence of sleep apnea. There were significant differences in plasma amyloid levels between obese adolescents without sleep apnea and those with on. Uh, at, least, uh, at the same time, the level of plasma amyloid levels in non-obese patients with uh, apnea are significantly higher uh, than the control. In conclusion, it should be noted that the uh, uh, sleep apnea is multifactorial disease and is often has concurrent pathology that hinders of uh, healthy living and well-being. It is recommended addressing and treating this sleep disorder in a personalized manner by the health professionals as somnologists and pediatrists, endocrinologists, ANT specialists, neurologists, psychologists, or psychiatrists. Uh, it's also recommending serious consider the maintaining of sleep profile and optimal weight in children and adolescents for ameliorating lifestyle, prevent of sleep disturbance associated with dysfunctions, and early dementia disorders in young adults. Further studies evaluating sleep data, cognitive functioning, and neurospecific plasma proteins after non-invasive continuous positive air pressure therapy as the most effective sleep apnea treatment in abyss adolescents will be needed. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Uh I would like to give the floor uh, to PhD Mikhail Kuzmin, who is research assistant of the Laboratory of Social Significant Problems of Reproduction, Scientific Center for Family Health and Human Re uh, Reproduction Problems from Irkutsk. Please, uh, Mikhail Kuzmin. Uh, I'd like to tell you about dysfunctional attitudes and identity among adolescent girls. This gynecological disorders. My name is Mikhail Kuzmin and uh, I like to see uh, you. Uh, so, uh, I'm, you know, dysfunctional attitudes are an integral part of Iron Back depression model. According to her, some people have negative depressogenic patterns that are activated or aggravated by stressful life events. These depressogenic schemes are organized into the functional attitudes. Um, the stable rules of behavior in unforeseen circumstances that determine emotional experience and self-esteem of an individual. These dysfunctional attitudes are often grouped into two categories. One category is perfectionism and self-critical attitudes. It is uh, two categories. Uh, for example, if I fail, especially it is just as bad as I complete failure. And uh, conditioning attitude, for example, I am nothing if the person I love doesn't like me. So, activation of these dysfunctional attitudes by stressful events or negative mood leads to negative proceeding on information categorized by distorting function. For example, biased interpretation, excessive generalization, all of nothing things, and then so on. And these negative self assessments and reflections um, is very important in uh, this model. Thanks to this uh, mechanism, the prosthogenic schemes and life stress contribute to the development of a negative cognitive triad. It is a very important moment. Negative ideas about oneself, the world, and the future, and which, as Beck suggests, is the last path to depression. It was the depression model. But modern studies demonstrate the validity of the fact that dysfunctional disorders can underlie not uh, only depressive experience, but also affect the body image, uh, gambling, addiction, and so on. And in our study, we think that uh, 
uh, these dysfunctional attitudes can be associated with uh, personality identity. Personal identity is a sense of internal continuity and identity of personality. According to Marcia, uh, in his uh, state of theory of identity, uh, this uh, problem uh, consider of some status of identity. For example, the status of a confused or crisis identity, the status of achieved identity, not crisis identity, and the status of predeterminated identity, in uh, intermediate status, this uh, status model. So, in our previous studies, we have shown that the identity statuses of adolescent girl differ depending on the presence or absence of gynecological disorders in them. In turn, informed identity can become a condition for their psychological health. So take a look at this slide. We are interested how dysfunctional attitudes and identity statuses are related. In adolescent girls, it's and without gynecological disorders. According to our opinion, this connection can help correct identity through changing the functional attitudes. Uh, and uh, it is a very interesting moment. So look at the next, next, uh, no, not, not this, uh, but uh, this, yes. Uh, the study was conducted in the period from September to October in 2020 year in various schools in Irkutsk. It was attended by 327 teenager girls uh, of different ethnicity. You can see uh, this in the slide and the gynecological status. This feature of a sample are presented in the table on the slide uh, and in this slide too. You look at the distribution of subject by uh, some uh, pathologists. Uh, the study used such uh, questionnaires as uh, Beck Weissman scale of dysfunctional beliefs, dysfunctional attitude scale in uh, our adaptation by Zakharova, ego status uh, structure test by Soldatova, and uh, Beck depression inventory, you know this instrument, uh, BDI, by Aaron Beck, of course. Uh, statistical analysis was carried out using the Krasko Wallace test first and the Spearman's rank correlation criteria. All calculations they are carried out in the SPSS uh, statistic package, statistic package for social science. And the look at this picture in this table, results. At first stage, we analyze the connection existing between the scale of say test the scale of dysfunctional beliefs and the back depression scale. And you can see the correlation in, the, uh, in this table. As follow from the table, there is a close correlation between the scale of dysfunctional beliefs, just the scale of say test and the back depression scale, very close correlation. But namely, the higher the level of dysfunctional beliefs, the higher the level of depression. It is an interesting moment, but more important next information. There are difference depending on these girls, uh, uh, not, not, not the nature of relationship between dysfunctional beliefs and identity statuses is not so unambiguous. The higher the level of dysfunctional beliefs, the higher the level of confused identity. It is important and the low level of achieved and predeterminated status of identity. At the same time, there are differences depending on these girls have gynecological disorders or not. Although the nature of the relationship between the main scales of SA test and BDI does not change, nevertheless. In girls without gynecological disorders, there is no significant relationship between the scale of dysfunctional beliefs and predeterminate identity. And in girls, this 
such with relationship is present. It is a very important difference. At the next stage, okay, okay, at the next stage, oh, look at this picture. Uh, we divided the female subjects according to the level of dysfunctional beliefs, according to the adaptation of uh, this uh, uh, methodology, uh, Beck Weissman test. In general, there were no differences in the level of identity statuses in girls with and without gynecological pathologies. And at the same time, differences in status of identity depending on the level of dysfunctional beliefs are present in all these gynecological pathologies in all scale or the say test. Look at uh, uh, this part of the uh, slide. Namely, the higher the level of dysfunctional beliefs, the higher the level of confused identity, and the less the level of achieved and predeterminated identities. And there are no such differences in adolescent girls without gynecological pathologies. It turns out that in girls without gynecological pathologies, although there are links between identity statuses and the scale of dysfunctional beliefs, however, there are no differences depending on the levels. However, the girl with gynecological disorder, such differences are present. And it is a very interesting moment. An explanation for these features can be found in the study of the relationship between identity statuses and different levels of dysfunctional attitudes. In all these gynecological <coughs> disorders, significant relationship between identity statuses and dysfunctional attitudes are present if they are expressed at an average and high level while in girls without gynecological disorders, there are a significant relationship only if dysfunctional attitudes are highly expressed. Presumably, in such a way that dysfunctional attitudes have a greater influence on the identity statuses of girls with gynecological disorders than girls without it. However, the features of a sample do not allow testing this hypothesis using analysis of variance. It is a problem of this study. And in general, we can conclude the following. There are connection between dysfunctional attitudes and identity statuses in adolescent girls and dysfunctional attitudes are inversely related to the statuses of achieved and predeterminate identity and directly to the status of confused identity. At the same time, adolescent girls with gynecological disorders, depending on the severity levels of dysfunctional attitudes, have differences in identity statuses, while their peers without gynecological disorders do not. And, uh, and at the end of this, um, uh, report. Uh, we think that the results obtained can be used uh, when planning work with teenage girls in order to form a positive self attitude and correct crisis manifestation in uh, identity uh, because it is very important problem in psychology, uh, especially uh, in the work with adolescent girls. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, your question if you want. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mikhail Kuzmin. It is very interesting. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, let me suggest the next speaker, uh, Ms. Uh, Anastasia Votineva, who is General Research Assistant of the Laboratory of Psychoneurosomatic Pathology of Childhood, Scientific Center for Family Health and Human Reproduction Problems from Irkutsk. Please, Anastasia Votineva. Uh, good day, dear colleagues. Let me introduce the report of the topic, Psychological Correction of the Dolores and Obesity is a multifactorial chronic progressive and relapsing disease. 
Due to the escalating spread of it and its severe health consequences, it is considered to be one of the most serious health problems of 21st century. Unlike the most other chronic diseases, obesity was the effect not only the adult population but also the younger generation. According to the World Health Organization, about uh, 170 million children worldwide have an elevated body mass index. But because of the low diagnostic alternatives to the disease, numbers can be much higher. Psycho diseases develop as a, uh, as a, a result of mental and somatic factors. The clinical features of obesity combine the two factors to informational and social stress generally affects on the patient's body and contribute to the development of psychosomatic disease. Many problems of adolescence and obesity treatment are both medical and social. For example, parents and children don't usually think of treatment. It makes them go to see the doctor late. Uh, so as a result, we see a vicious circle. About 90% of adolescents do not recover till they are and further disease affect their health condition and make their life quality worse. Interdisciplinary interaction of all space trailers is now becoming increasingly important in the development of corrective problem for adolescent obesity. Because physiological factors play an important role of development of this group of disorders, many authors recommend not only taking medication but also getting physiological psychological help. At methods on psychological correction of adolescent with obesity with author. Observation and conservation for the interview, a behavioral therapy, we change attitude and behavioral strategies, obtain relaxation technique, autogenic uh, training will help you feel your body better. Problem centered family therapy to understand where the signs of somatic illness come from. Before you work with the problem, you need to resource. This stage is some kind of emotional support of the patient because usually a patient who suffers tends to blame and shame himself or herself for being overweight. And the main methods uh, are art therapy and biofeedback therapy. Com uh, combination of the methods will help to achieve more effective results. Conversation and observation is carried out to collect private information, uh, compiling an anamnesis of the patient and patient's family. This stage is essential for further development on uh, psychological correction.
make a diagnostic alone to find out more about patient and help it further work with him or her. Psychological diagnostic and education, it helps patient to understand how his or her mind and body works. When the patient is provided with the adequate explanation, everything becomes easier and he or she finds answers for his or her questions. In the process of art therapy, a person sensitive to his or her personal past traumatic experience, feelings, and illness changes. And the achieved the psychotherapeutic effect shows itself the correct ordering of psychosomatic processes. Creative activity gives person a state of mental comfort. Patient being as an artist turns into a spectator, dictating, um, distancing himself or herself from the problem and watch transformations from the outside. Game therapy. A game for a child is the most natural way to talk about himself or herself, about feelings, thoughts, and experience. Exile uh, considers play as a process in which child plays out his feelings and brings them to surface outwards, getting the opportunity to look them from the another side and learn to control them to refute them. You can see biofeedback equipment. We can obtain health regulation mechanism using biofeedback. In the future, he has patient to react in another way to when it comes to stressful situation, he or she follows the most energy saving strategy that excludes destructive and self-destructive behavior. Biofeedback technique looks like this. In order to learn how to control the physiological process in the body, a person needs to observe the slightest changes in the control function in real time, second by second. Using biofeedback, a person tries to control the process by observing the results of these attempts on the monitor screen. During self-regulation, the person discovers and remembers those internal efforts that leads a change in the chosen direction and gradually obtain the ability to control states and body parameters. In our case, teenager wins to control his or her eating behaviors emotional state. The sensor room is called the relaxation room, but actually the sensor room can be used not only to provide calming and relaxing effect, but also to achieve a tonic and stimulating effect. A comprehensive clinical and psychological examination of 150 obese children and adolescents was carried out. The types of eating behavior and the quality of life of this category of patients were studied. An analysis of somatopsychological characteristics in children with obesity less than two years old uh, showed such facts like a high level of anxiety compared to age norms, the formation of aggressive psychosocial behavior, an inferiority complex, a reduced level of social contacts, and weak motivation for dieting and weight self-control. The correction of work we selected two groups of overweight girls with gynecological diseases. The age of the subject uh, from 14 to 16 years, the first group included 20 girls who were hospitalized for the first time in the medical institution. The second group included 20 girls who had previously undergone treatment. In order to cure the identified disorders, motivational training was carried out with methods of behavioral therapy the use of which is combination with obesity diet therapy helps to change nutritional strategies, patients' motivations in terms of weight and metabolic disorders, as well as in dynamics of the behavioral strategies. Following medical recommendations, it improved the patient's quality of life. The main method of correction was biofeedback and art therapy. Biofeedback is the method in which a person learns to control body function that are using beyond conscious control with the help of Feedback. The very name biofeedback contains a basic principle. The purpose of any feedback it comes from the, our body is to give us opportunity to learn something new, a skill, a pattern, or behavior. Health therapy provides relaxation and release of their emotions, reduces anxiety, control for emotions, help to understand your emotions at the term behavioral level. And also, health therapy has a very important stage the development of emotional intelligence. Almost always patients with obesity do not understand their feelings and try to get rid of 
them, often by eating, drinking. This way, at this stage, the psychologist acts as a some kind of mirror that reflects patient's feeling, helping to realize inner feeling and desires at the same time. Uh, conclusions. Changes in treatment motiv uh, motifs were associated with normalization of eating behavior, improved perception of one's own body, optimization of personality, self-esteem processes. The process of uh, psychological correction developed by us containing diagnostic, informational, correction, and developmental aspects of working with adolescent girls and build individual and group forms attributes to the development of motives for treatment in adolescent girls with obesity. Since 2020, we have been conducting the study on the topic from formation of the motive for treatment of adolescents with obesity. A comprehensive clinical and psychological examination of 200 of these adolescents was carried out. The types of eating behavior, the quality of life of this category of patients were studied. A corrective program to reduce this weight was developed and implemented. Research is currently being worked. Project School of Eating Behavior for School Students. The purpose of the project is to identify study eating disorder, leading to overweight and obesity in school students. Project calls for a popular science lecture of the subject of the project uh, to diagnose eating disorders and factors leading to overweight and obesity in case of students, to include biofeedback to in education activity to help adolescents learn how to keep themselves healthy, to develop and carry out a corrective program uh, of activities using the methods of biofeedback therapy and art therapy. Results. From November 16, 2021, a survey of 342 Children in grade of uh, from seven to nine was carried out. Eleven popular science lectures of the themes expressed in our life were held. Psychological correction is obesity in adolescence is a hot topic, and we plan to continue to develop in this direction. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, a uh, very interesting uh, report. Um, I want to give uh, the next word to co-moderator uh, uh, co um, and young colleagues, uh, Irina Cherivikova, with, uh, with the report um, Emotional Impairments uh, in uh, Adolescents Who Have and Gone COVID-19. Uh, you are welcome. Dear colleagues, dear guests, let me introduce the presentation entitled Emotional Impairments in Adolescents Who Have Undergone COVID-19. As you know, more than a year ago, an outbreak of a new coronavirus infection occurred in the PR China, which later, after its rapid spread around the world, was assigned the status of a pandemic by the World Health Organization. In Russia, from 2020 to present, there has been an increase in the number of COVID-19 infections among the population. So, according to operational data, more than 80 million cases of COVID-19 infection have been de uh, detected in Russia. More than 3,000 cases of COVID-19 infection uh, have been identified in the Rusk region. At the same time, many researchers know that the COVID-19 pandemic can have serious consequences for mental health. This is especially true for such a fragile uh, age period as adolescents are posing a high risk of developing psychosomatic disorders. I know that in Russia, according to the latest data, children account for 80% of registered cases of COVID-19. At the same time, among those children who have been ill, the majority are teenagers. In the other country, the epidemiological also causes concern. For example, in the United States, nearly uh, 14 million children have tested positive for COVID-19 since the start of pandemic, according to available government records. Nearly 3,031 of these cases have been identified in the past four weeks. In total, approximately 6 million reported cases were detected in 2022. Here in this graph, it's very clear that from the very beginning of the pandemic, children made up a small percentage of adult cases in the flesh, 
until the last week. When in the U.S., children account for 80% of reported cases of COVID-19 according to the latest data. say that most people who have had COVID-19 know the long recovery after this infection. It was the long-term symptoms after COVID-19 that made me pay attention to the so-called post-COVID syndrome. The term long COVID has been coined by patients and has been taken hold in the mainstream media. And then the classification of the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence of Great Britain was proposed. According to which they are divided. Acute COVID uh, signs and symptoms of COVID 19 persist for no more than four weeks. Long COVID is the persistent symptoms of COVID 19 for four to 12 weeks. And post COVID condition occurs in young people with a history of confirmed SARS CoV 2 uh, infection, uh, which are late, which at least one persistent physical symptoms for a minimum duration of 12 weeks after initial testing that cannot be explained by alternative diagnosis. These symptoms have an impact on everyday functioning, may continue or develop after COVID infection, and may fluctuate or relapse over time. The SARS-CoV-2 virus continues to mutate, and Delta, Delta Plus, and Omicron strains have been rapidly spreading a affecting not only adults but also children. According to a number of studies from different countries, the features of the new coronavirus infection in the child population is that the incidence of the COVID-19 is still lower in children and adolescents compared to adults. It should be noted that in children, the duration of Course of COVID 19 has its own specifics. So, according to some data, the average duration of the acute phase of COVID 19 in children aged 5 to 12 years is 5 days, and in adolescents aged 12 to 17 years is 7 days. At the same time, according to research, COVID syndrome is characterized by the most significant consequences of the development of children. Like the COVID-19, post-COVID syndrome uh, can affect multiple organs and affect the range of symptoms, including the respiratory, cardiovascular, nervous, and mental health. Prevalence post-COVID among those who have been healed, according to various sources, range from 1 to 15%. In Russia, 25% of children discharged from the hospital after COVID-19. The symptoms of post-COVID syndrome persist for five months or more. To a number of studies, the most common symptoms of post COVID syndrome in the emotional sphere are depressive states, anxiety, fatigue, emotional lability. It is known that adolescent is a unique period of personality formation, a transitional stage of physical and mental development from puberty to adulthood. Many factors such as stress factor of illness can increase the susceptibility of adolescents to external influences, manifesting as emotional, cognitive, behavioral disorders, and social maladjustment. The aim of our study was emotional development in adolescents after COVID-19 in the region. The study conducted from November 2021 to June 2022 in the clinic of the Scientific Center for Family Health and Production Problems involved 52 adolescents from 10 to 17 years old who had undergone COVID-19. The 
criteria for inclusion in the study. A history of laboratory confirmation such a history of mild symptoms of COVID-19, a certain age period, uh, 10 to 17, the ability to form consent of the legal representative of the adolescent to participate in the study. Exclusion criteria. In compliance with the inclusion criteria, the presence of a common disease, methmal, hypertension, etc. The presence of mental development disorders, mental retardation, autism, terrible palsy, etc. Refusal of the patient or legal representative to participate. Most of the respondents included in the study were diagnosed with COVID-19 in January 2022 and October 2021. This may indicate that adolescents included in the study were infected with the brain delta, delta plus, and Omicron of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. All adolescents included in this study were divided into six groups depending on the period after the disease. The first group, one month after COVID-19, the second group, two months after COVID-19, the third group, three months after COVID-19, the first group, fourth month after COVID-19, the fifth group, from half a year to a year after COVID-19 and the sixth group more than a year after COVID-19. We use the following research methods, clinical history using the standardized interview methods. It includes the collection of anamnestic information about the respondent, gender, age, family, features of the course of COVID-19, features of the state of the COVID-19, the presence of concomitant diseases. In the process of the standardized interview with the teenagers, stressful situation at various stages of his life, the presence of stressful experience at the same time as the examination are also analyzed. In addition, we use bad depression inventory and CMASS. It was found out that a couple of respondents had the following clinical symptoms fever, urea, cough, sore throat, fatigue, anosmia, uh, dysgeusia, headache, especially frontal area of head. Seventy-three percent of adolescents had the following clinical symptoms of COVID-19 after discharge. Symptoms such as weakness, apathy, loss of appetite, nausea, sensitivity, aching joints, per hour, and their duration range from 1 to 28 weeks after the report of the diagnosis of COVID-19. The frequent and most durable clinical symptoms of COVID-19 after discharge is anosmia and dysphysia. Anosmia in 46% uh, of adolescents duration from 2 to 64 weeks after recovery from COVID. Dyskizia in 42% of adolescents duration from 2 to 64 weeks after recovery from COVID. A third of the surveyed adolescents revealed high anxiety in periods from a month to a month and from a year or more after recovery from COVID. Also, a third of the surveyed adolescents revealed a depressive state in all the study periods after suffering COVID 19. 
I know that the severe depression was detected only in periods of two and three months after suffering COVID-19. During the second month after suffering COVID-19, the most unfavorable emotional state was revealed among adolescents in their good condition. In conclusion, I would like to know that at present, there are still many problems in the study of post-COVID syndrome. Namely, to date, the prognosis of adolescent patients who have undergone COVID-19 has not yet been fully understood. There are no specific strategies for managing adolescents with post-COVID syndrome. At the same time, we believe that it is necessary to conduct additional large-scale studies to study the post-COVID syndrome. Thanks for your attention. So why psychosomatic disorders of children in India and Russia? Why a comparison with India and Russia? I choose the comparison between India and Russia as a person who live in India and now living in Russia. I have seen the life of both countries. So before I start my uh, presentation, I want to be familiar with these four words, psychosomatic medicine, psychophysiology, neuropsychology, and mind-body medicine. These are all same, but used in different countries for the same thing. So let's start our presentation with the famous words written by Erniomers Gopp, a German physician. He always, he says, the reason why a sound body becomes ill or an ailing body recovers very often lies in the mind. Contrawise, the body can both beget mental illness and heal its offsprings. Simply we can say, according to him, mind is the supreme decider or manipulator who can decide whether your body should be healed or healthy. So let's go, let's see what is psychosomatic, what is not. It's all in your head, it's made up. It's the things which you are being weak or it can divide, decide what you to be. A chemical chain reaction due to nervous system dysregulation that shifts your endocrine, immune and other body systems and causes a new or accepted existing physical symptoms. So when it comes to children, we can say that these are the symptoms which uh, disturbs them like uh, abdominal pain, headaches, chest pain, fatigue, limb pain, back pain, worry about their health, difficulty in breathing, etc. So these are the symptoms. We actually, I just don't want to say more about the psychosomatic symptoms in the whole the ways. I'm just concentrating about the symptoms among the pediatric or the children. So these are all things which makes their lives miserable due to stress and other reasons. So let's go to the main part of the topic, psychosomatic disorders of children in India. Before that, I want to give an introduction about uh, India because that are the factors which are going to be affect the health of the students. So the main thing is about the population. As you all know, it's in India. It's a very last populated country, like more than 1.3 billion people. So, and the population of men are more than the population of women. It's a very diverse country with more than 1,652 languages spoken and among that 22 are officially recognized languages. So you can see that when I move from my state to another state, like in a region, the language is totally changed. They, can, they cannot even understand each other. These are all the factors affecting the psychosomatic stages and even the treatment factors and the diagnosis factors. So this in the country is a worst, uh, it's a vast country with uh, to more than 22,000 ethnic groups, different conditions of people, like a, com a country with a vast var variety and diversity. So the levels of education in rural area and urban area is divided in the variations in socio-economic status further contribute the diversity in the country. 72.2 percentage of the population lives in rural areas and agriculture continues to be the main occupation of the majority, majority of the people in the country. So when it comes to the employment, 
among children you can see the yellow mark which is like uh, it's been more in the period of from 2004 to 2010 and then it declined and it's by the age age group of students from 7 to 14 so the wasting among children you can see the same graph the yellow graph you can see and uh, under the five other countries it's a, it's a classical uh, differentiation so neuropsychology in india so as you see this man he is the dr professor narayan reddy he is the uh, he is considered as the father of uh, uh, neuro neuropsychology in india it's a specialization that's been only started 40 years ago in the unit of national institute of mental health and neuro sciences it has not been considered as a specialization till 40 years ago so currently work within the field of neuropsychology has focused on child geriatric acute brain injury and forensic populations despite the shortcomings the field of neuropsychology has received much attention in the recent years with the number of referrals and professionals increasing so neuropsychology in nim hands the neuropsychology unit offers assessment rehabilitation services neurological neuropsychological psychiatric conditions neuropsychological bacteries eeg and cognitive genomics the neuropsychological bacteries include tests adapted from west test modified or developed based on theories such as lurius method the famous russian scientist of assessment and few indigenously developed test the neurosegological bacteria in india the nimhans neuropsychology bacteria based on lurius method was the first neuropsychological bacteria to be developed in india as i said it was only before 40 years ago neurosegological battery for children was the first child neurosegological battery in india so the the test performed in the neuropsychological bacteria are the motor free visual perception test visio visio spatial working memory proportions maze token test re auditory verbal learning test picture completion block design color cancellation trail making test phonemic fluency designs fluency and memory for the designs these are the tests used for the neuropsychological battery for children in nim hands so the main challenges faced by the neuropsychologists in india as we have already i have already mentioned the linguistic backgrounds pure infrastructure now it's been changed but still the india is a country with the maximum infrastructure and a poor infrastructure but it's always a uh, challenge for the neuropsychologist pure awareness among the patients the most important thing levels of education and lower literacy india is a country which is having a high literacy rate in some states and a very low literacy rate in other states as this diversity and uh, the the money they have to pay for the neurosurgical assessments were the main significant factors for the less referrals in the neuropsychologist uh, for the neuropsychologists in india so as when we decide about the medicine of any field in india i always it comes to ayurveda so there is a method of management in psychosomatic disorders in ayurveda according to the ayurveda the life process has been conceived as the composite entity of four things mainly the sharira which is the physical body indriya the senses means eye ears skin etc sattva the mind and atma the conscious element so according to that according to the main element about the correlation of the these four elements is the main thing which is a statement in ayurveda called sarindriya satma vasam yoga the correlation of the four elements is the healthy is the factor of health in your body if they don't correlate with each other properly you are ill so the management also is based on these psychic phases psychoneurotic phase psychosomatic phase and advanced organic phase so in ayurveda there are methods of treatment like the yoga is the one of the most uh, important part in the treatment of psychosomatic disorders in india as there is a whole course of yoga in our section so i am not going deep into that so we can it simply said that in ayurveda there are less side effect thick and more effective methods for the management of psychosomatic disorder it's a very difference between russia and india
So the main thing of my uh, uh, presentation, I've taken a cross-sectional study of psychosomatic condition in children of eight to 15 years of age in Rashko Taluka in Gujarat. A study was done by Dr. Sridhar V. Ravel and published in the International Journal of Medical Science and Public Health. And I'm just presenting you the results to identify, I'm not generalizing it the whole uh, example of India, but to generalize the conditions of India, the psychosomatic occurrence of psychosomatic disorders of the children in India. The psychosomatic condition is found to be more prevalent in girls than in males. I will uh, explain the reason about it uh, in the last discussion part. This is significantly more in rural and slum community, 31.25 percentage and 23.08 percentage. It is more reported at age of 11 to 13 years age in urban area, psychosomatic condition found to be higher in males, education and birth order to not have any significance in the reporting of psychosomatic condition. So now the psychosomatic disorders of children in Russia. So is the father of modern uh, neuropsychology in Russia, Alexander Luria, the most famous scientist. Is the, his methods has been used all over the world. Psychosomatic disorders of Russian children. The incidence of psychosomatic pathology for children is up to 70% of all children applying to children's polyclinics, while periodic psychosomatic complaints without clear psychological reasons are not up to 10% of cases. The factors of psychosomatic disorders of Russia of Russian children. We have already discussed the Indian children, now Russian children. Stress pedagogical tactics, social and educational fears, stress of limited time and competition, perfectionism and energy consumption of innovative schools, low physical activity, mobbing and bullying, domestic violence. And uh, the incidence of uh, if we talk about the risk factors about the Russian children, uh, in our opinion, the structure of deviant forms of parenthood should include the, such risk factors for psychosomatic disorders as social orphanhood, alcohol usage of parents, various forms of domestic violence against the children. These are all the risk factors we can see. Now the comparison between Russia and India. So I'm just briefing my uh, presentation with saying that the main reason of the psychosomatic disorders of children in India are about the reasons are the language differences, the poverty, uh, the educational system, the pressure which the family has giving to the students to ensure their uh, uh, career guidance and all. The, the main, the why, why the reason that uh, the females are more in cases because of the discrimination face that not equal, the females are not considered as equal as males in India. And in Russia, the main reasons are between about the bullying, actual usages, the relationship between parents and teachers and students, etc. In Russia, the major stress factors can be resolved with simple techniques and the treat, Ayurvedic treatments also plays a main role among the mobilization of the students to each other. So uh, with this, I'm concluding my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And um, if anyone have any doubts about the presentation, I'm open to questions. Uh, let me suggest the next speaker uh, is Irina Garbets, PhD, who uh, head of uh, Department uh, of Applied and Experimental uh, Language, Linguistics. Uh, head of the Center of uh, uh, Speech Pathology from uh, Kozan. Uh, please, Yelena Garabets. Hello, dear colleagues. My name is Yelena Garabets. I work at Kazan Federal <laughs> University. I would like to present my report on alexithymia and psychosomatic diseases in adolescents. And I uh, would focus on primary headaches in children and adolescents. Uh, the next slide. Please. Alexithymia is regarded as an interdisciplinary problem. So there are a lot of specialists who work on alexithymia. Uh, at first, these are psychiatrists, uh, clinical psychologists, clinical linguists, and the specialists in different spheres, uh, general practitioners, and uh, specialists in cardiovascular diseases, and so on and so on. Uh, why is it so? What is alexithymia? What is the phenomenon of alexithymic personality? Uh, 
what is a risk of developing psychosomatic diseases in alexithymic people, in adults and in children and adolescents? These are the questions uh, that we will discuss today. And um, I'll focus on alexithymia and central sensitization in adolescents with primary headaches, migraine and tension type headache, because there is lack of research in this sphere at this very moment. The phenomenon of alexithymic personality is, uh, uh, has been studied uh, from uh, the 50s of the 20th century, and alexithymic personality is described as a person who has difficulties in verbalizing feelings, who replaces uh, his uh, emotional and uh, feelings with a description of physical problems, uh, who tries to describe everything in the terms of anxiety depressive disorders, who has difficulties in understanding his or her own feelings and the feelings of other people, a person who has decreased ability to symbolize and metaphorize, a person who has atypical emotional reactions, the poverty of interpersonal contacts, uh, weak social communication, mechanistic type of thinking, and poor understanding of nonverbal signs, nonverbal signs which um, manifest emotions and feelings. The relatives of persons with a high level of alexithymia often note that these persons are rather cold, uh, emotional aloof, indifferent, and excessively serious. Uh, we can't say uh, that the alexithymic personality is devoid of imagination. It is better to say that um, the imagination doesn't concern the emotional sphere, and the ability to symbolize and memorize also touch upon the emotional sphere. Not in general. Uh, speech is a complex and multidimensional functional system which is based on many links and the joint work of different parts of the cerebral cortex. So we can talk about highly specific non-systemic speech disorders which are not, which are not regarded in a physiology or for instance uh, in the field of cognitive impairment. The morphological substrate that causes these disorders is inaccessible to modern equipment and requires the creation of highly sensitive psychometric instruments, which are aimed precisely at a narrow local deficit. And alexithymia is also one of these deficiencies. Research for brain mechanism for the development of alexithymia is very active, and there are a lot of hypotheses. Please change the slide. Thank you so much. So, alexithymia is connected with the lack of exteriorization of emotions, sensations, and feelings. Different versions of this exteriorization, including verbal. So, a person uh, doesn't express his or her feelings. That's why it leads to psychosomatic diseases. It is one of the most uh, uh, frequent problems in the research connected with alexithymia. These psychosomatic diseases can be neurological, psychiatric, cardiovascular, bronchopulmonary, and so on and so on. The researchers uh, uh, write about the growth of quantity of these psychosomatic diseases connected with the high level of alexithymia uh, with a comorbidity and more severe course of treatment. For instance, if we um, treat uh, adults with headaches, uh, the course of treatment is more severe because they don't respond to the treatment as the persons without uh, high level of alexithymia, with low level. So functional somatic symptoms often manifest during childhood and adolescence, and the genesis is actively studied in modern literature. That's why it is very important to regard alexithymia and psychosomatic diseases in children. Uh, could you please change the slide? Well, thank you so much. The international research on alexithymia uh, is connected with different aspects of psychosomatic disorders, of child-parent relationships, styles of, uh, and features of education, with childhood trauma, and the presence of somatization and parents. Uh, these research, um, uh, which is uh, which uh, is connected with uh, the attitudes between children and parents, uh, the styles, coping strategies, and so on and so on, are very popular in European countries and in America. And uh, 
in Russia. Also, we have the research connected with the study of autistic traits in these children, autoimmune diseases, bronchopulmonary diseases, uh, and uh, epileptic seizures, cardiovascular diseases, nephropathy. Uh, it is very important that alexithymia uh, correlates with a higher level of anxiety and depression, that children with a higher level of alexithymia uh, uh, very often have suicidal thoughts, but not attempts. And uh, it is very difficult to do something with this high level of alexithymia. That's why it is necessary to work out different coping strategies for them. It is a very important question. And uh, we can say that uh, there is a lack of research connected with the study of pain and the level of alexithymia. Uh, the next slide, please. That's why we um, uh, started our research connected with the assessment of alexithymia and central sensitization in adolescents with primary headaches. We took um, the sample of children with migraine and tension type headache. What is central sensitization? It is a phenomenon manifested by an increase in the responses of not susceptible neurons of the central nervous system, which comes in response to normal or sub-threshold stimuli. People with central sensitization uh, can have acute perception of stimuli, more severe cause of treatment, sleep disorders, unexplained muscle tensions, and other symptoms. So, uh, pain, alexithymia, and central sensitization in uh, adolescents uh, are for the first time in uh, the scope together. Could you please change the slide? Our study group included 84 adolescents with primary headaches, 51 females and 33 males. The average age uh, of 14 from 13 till uh, 16. The methods uh, that were used in our research are the diagnosis of headache uh, was conducted according to the criteria for the International Classification of Headache Disorder Edition. Central sensitization assessment uh, it was assessed with central sensitization inventory. Uh, Russian version uh, of this inventory was conducted in the Kazan Federal University in the laboratory of uh, neurocognitive research. Uh, we worked with authors and from their permission um, created and validated the Russian version of central sensitization inventory. Uh, the same thing with alexithymia assessment. Uh, there is an instrument, alexithymia questionnaire for children. We also worked with authors and from their permission created and validated the Russian version of this uh, questionnaire. So we worked uh, using these instruments. Pain intensity uh, was measured uh, using visual analog scale and we uh, measured the number of months with pain per year, the number of days with pain per month, night sleep duration, and age of speech onset. It is rather important, it seemed to us that it is rather important because we work with the problem uh, of absence of words for feelings. That's why uh, it could be connected with uh, different uh, speech um, capacities of our respondents in the study group. Could you please change the slide? So we received the following parameters. This is age, months per year with a headache, days per month with a headache, headache intensity, level of alexithymia, level of central sensitization, onset of phrasal speech, and night sleep duration. Could you please change the slide? Uh, the results that we obtained showed a direct correlation between the level of lexithymia and the severity of central sensitization in adolescents with primary headaches. You can see the graph one. Could you please change the slide? Also, we received a direct correlation between the number of days with headaches per month and the severity of central sensitization. You can see the graph two. Uh, but there were no significant correlation between the duration of headaches during one month and the severity of alexithymia. 
and no significant correlation between the severity of alexithymia, the level of central sens sensitization, the intensity of headache, as well as the night sleep duration and the timing of the start of phrasal speech. It was a surprise for us, but it was so. So it is advisable to recommend uh, the doctors to assess the level of alexithymia and central sensitization in adolescents uh, who have complaints uh, of headaches during the initial visit and urine therapy too, uh, in case of negative dynamics, uh, especially to involve clinical psychologists in the management of the patient in order to work out the coping strategies for them and to uh, make the procedure of treatment uh, less severe. Thank you very much for your attention and for giving me the floor for this presentation. I'm waiting for your questions. Uh, Elena Garabet, it, uh, it was a wonderful presentation. I would like to give the floor uh, next uh, speakers. Uh, Um, to me, yesterday students uh, of the Department of uh, Psychiatry and Medical Psychology of Irkutsk State Medical University from Irkutsk. Oh, uh, please, Nikolai Mandano. Excuse me for interrupting, uh, but uh, we cannot uh, hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, please restart your reports. Okay. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. My title is Psychosomatic Dysfunctions Associated with Non-Psychotic Affective Disorders in Adolescent Girls. Uh, can you see the next slide? Okay. Uh, the adolescents with amenorrhea show a higher incidence of subclinical symptoms of anorexia nervosa, including psychosomatic discomfort and mild depressive traits. The limitations of studies on patients with amenorrhea and comorbid depression have received little attention. Therefore, we performed this study to evaluate endocrine hormones levels in the presence of these conditions in an attempt to further explore the relationship between amenorrhea and anxiety depressive disorders and to evaluate the role that endocrine hormones play in anorexia nervosa and comorbid depression. The prevalence and severity of affective disorders among women and significantly higher when compared with men, which is associated with hormonal characteristics during the reproductive period. A number of studies indicate a direct relationship between the manifestation of affective disorders and the level of estradiol and luteinizing hormone in the late luteal phase. During puberty in adolescent girls, symptoms of menstrual irregularities are strongly associated with symptoms of depression. In the same age period, the third phase is prevalent among these contingents occupied by eating disorders. Materials is adolescent girls patients of the gynecological hospital aged from 15 to 18 years with menstrual irregularities and comorbid affective spectrum disorders. Total 119 for girls. All girls gave their informed consent to participate in the study. The patients were divided into two large groups according to the level of LH and FSH. For the primary screening of patients, the patient has questionnaire 9 and general anxiety disorder 7. Questionnaires were used to, use to assess the severity of affective disorders. The Aminiki diagnostic interview and the Akinbach questionnaire to assess mental disorders. 
for follow-up two years as well as MPI to assess the present personality disorders. Laboratory studies include the determination on the levels FSH, LH, prolactin, estradiol, testosterone, and anthropometric height, weight, waist circumference, and body mass index. Statistical processing of the results was carried using the JAST statistic and Microsoft Office Excel. So going on to the results. In this slide you can show the structure of the gynecological pathology. On the structure of mental pathology, this is displayed to a lesser extent since most of the dysmorphophobic patients and patients with anorexia nervosa qualify as patients with adjustment disorder, which is due to a significant number of stress factors such as uh, parental divorce, alcoholism or of one or less often both parents, conflict situations at school, bullying by peers. As can be seen on this slide, for most psychometric indicators, there is a statistically significant excess in people with mental disorders. At the same time, if we divide the sample according to a hormonal profile, then a clear picture does not emerge. The statistically significant increase in the level of anxiety and depression with a certain tendency towards an increase in level of aggression and socialization in general, which, however, does not lead to a significantly higher level of maladjustment and suicidal behavior. At the same time, if we divide the sample according to a hormonal profile, then a clear picture does not emerge. There is statistically significant increase in the level of anxiety and depression with a certain tendency towards an increase in the level of aggression and socialization in general. If if we divide the sample into clusters according to the spectrum of disorders, we will see that there is also a trend towards increased levels of anxiety and depression. For patients with symptoms of dysmorphophobia, this tendency is also a characteristic. It is important to note that here in the structure of disorders of the spectrum, eating disorders are not found in the entire cohort, but only in 40% of the participating patients. Of this number, the vast majority of 36% had disorders of the type of restrictive anorexia nervosa and only 4% cleansing. According to the eating disorder scale, only 5% of girls had bulimia. For patients with symptoms of dysmorphophobia, this strength is also characteristic. It is important to note here that in the structure of disorders of his of this spectrum, eating disorders are not found in the entire cohort, only the 5 percent. Так, а вы тоже переключаете мои слайды или как-то они листают, вспомню, неправильно? Uh, no, we cannot. For patients with symptoms of dysmorphophobia, this strength is also characteristic. Так, ну это уже было. On the structure of mental pathology, this is displayed to a lesser extent since most of the dysmorphophobic patients and patients with anorexia nervosa are classified as patients with adjustment disorders, which is due to a significant number of stress factors in combination with a short duration of observations, parental divorce, alcoholism, conflict situations at school, bullying by peers. Patient 
we suspected personality disorders are also recorded in the category of personality disorders or adjustment disorders F43 due to a short follow-up. Of the total number of uh, recurrent patients, uh, only 30 patients turned to a psychiatrist at the place of residence home of they applied again after reaching the age of majority. In treatment of them, I used a uh, duloxetine. Conclusion. Patients with diagnosed mental pathology have significantly higher levels of anxiety and depression. The level of social maladaptation, dysmorphophobia and anorexia nervosa were diagnosed with the highest frequency. In this regard, the entire spectrum of pathology on the YSR scale was divided into anxiety, depressive and dysmorphophobic disorders. And the relationship was established between the level of anxiety, depression, manifestations of anorexia nervosa, changes in the hormonal profile. In patients with symptoms of dysmorphophobia, the vast majority had disorders of the type of restrictive anorexia nervosa and only 4% cleansing. According to the eating disorder scale, only 5% of girls had bulimia. According to the severity of eating disorders, we can talk about the relative mildness of manifestations regardless of hormonal spectrum disorders, the neurotic level of disorders. According to clinical observations in the dynamics of these disorders, there is a tendency to reduce the severity of anxiety and depression as the treatment of gynecological pathology in patients with syndromic anxiety depressive symptoms. Patients with personality disorders of uh, cluster B do not have such dynamics. The absolute minority of patients with affective pathology after consultations turn to a psychiatrist, which indicates no yes, compliance and the need for oncoming traffic of internists and psychiatrists. Thank you for your attention. Dear colleagues, uh, thank you very, very much for your attention to our section uh, sorry sorry to for technical difficulties uh, uh, too we have had a good discussion of uh, diagnostic uh, treatment epidemiology rehabilitation associated with psychosomatic disorders in children and uh, adolescents special thanks to our speakers for their wonderful bright report. It would be great to continue, continue the conversation uh, we have uh, begun today in our few the joint events and perhaps uh, in uh, some joint interdisciplinary research. Would anyone like to have the floor? Maybe Professor uh, Polyakov? No. <laughs> Thank you to all the participants again. See you next time and take care and uh, good psychosomatic health. Всем спасибо огромное. Всех рады видеть и слышать. Еще раз технические трудности нас не смущают, и мы только закаляемся. Всех до новых встреч и ждем новых исследований, может быть, совместных исследований в таком прекрасном направлении, как психосоматическое здоровье детей и подростков. Всем спасибо! Спасибо большое. Всего доброго, до свидания, до новых встреч.